for our starts, I also want to invite everyone, perhaps to just take a moment um, and reflect um, on this moment right now, right, and, and on this space. Um, it's not often that we have black women coming together with a common purpose, um, you know, a, a, and a common purpose prefaced with love um, and genuine, you know, care for one another. Um, and so thank you everyone for being here and thank you for being able to listen. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to speak um, about a video um, that I came across um, a couple of weeks ago um, of a gentleman called Andy Lim Um He was speaking um, at the Way of Life Church, which is a black theology church um, in Kailisha, Cape Town. Um, and he um, uh, was presenting a talk titled, Black Consciousness as a Guiding Political Theory Can Be Trusted by All Black People, Including, and this was in capital letters, Including Women. Okay, so who's Andile Mkletama? Andile Mkletama is a prominent political and philosopher, philosopher, philosophical um, thinker um, who's very much vested um, in terms of thinking about black consciousness and how um, we could use it to achieve black liberation. Um, he has his history um, in organizations such as the September National Limbizo um, and more recently Black First, Land First. Um, okay, so. In this video, Andy Mkutama tries um, to argue um, uh, for why black radical feminists um, should stop making arguments against black consciousness. Um, and he tries, you know, and tries to justify, he brings forth um, various justifications of why black radical feminists are wrong for thinking black consciousness is anti-woman. Um, and I want to speak about this because I think it's, it's particularly important um, because we're gathered here speaking about, you know, black women's bodies, black women's lives, um, you know, and trying to locate that, right? And when we try and locate that, we have to come across the very un uh, inconvenient truth that a lot of the brutality that we feel and that we face in our bodies is at the hands of black men. And so we have to engage it, you know, uh, um, as such, Right, and we have to we have to rationalize it. We have to think about it, and we have to locate it within a broader conversation about decolonization and about you know reimagining ourselves um, as black people, as black women people, as black queer women people, as black queer trans women people. Um, and hopefully, this discussion today um, can bring us at least within the, within the realm of that conversation. Um, you know, and additionally, I want to speak about this because I think a lot of my time um, as somebody who's doing, you know, feminist work, black feminist work, um, uh, has been consumed um, by trying to navigate the spaces that I share um, with my with my with my black cishet um, men comrades, um, particularly within the Rose Must Fall movement, these Must Fall movements, um, you know, and and. Yeah, and so it's quite important for me to try and reflect, and, and I welcome everybody here to, to reflect with me. Um, so one of the first arguments um, Andila makes um, is that black consciousness is not inherently anti-woman. He makes two arguments um, uh, to justify this. The first one is that um, black radical feminists are judging black consciousness retrospectively. Um, which means that we're sitting here in 2016 as black radical feminists looking at a 1970s black consciousness and trying to um, ascribe what we know today um, and make it apply to them and what they know or should have known in, 19, no, 19, in the 1970s. And basically it's arguing that you know, the black consciousness that we see with Abu Barney Pijana, with Abu Steve Biko, is a black consciousness of its time and black consciousness has evolved until now. The second argument he makes um, is that black radical feminists are being unfair um, by judging black consciousness according um, to, you know, to, um, I don't know, individuals, right, um, and the personal decisions and behaviors of individuals such as Steve Biko. Um, but I think, um, Andy Lim, let's have a misses the point. Um, I think that it's not necessarily, you know, I, I don't think those are, are 
are, are, are the four arguments which are made by black radical feminists. Um, I think really um, the argument is that black consciousness, as conceptualized by people like Bonnie Pichana, Steve Biko, does not um, fully uh, speak um, to our complete uh, experiences and complete identities um, in Africa um, today, as black, you know, as black women, as black queer women in Africa today. You know, and you know, so it brings us to a certain point, um, you know, in terms of thinking about blackness. Um, however, it does not go beyond. It does not go beyond, you know, to interrogate um, the black woman. Um, position within Africa then and today. It does not go you know, forward um, to interrogate the complacency um, you know, of the black bourgeoisie you know, or the blacks who you know, are repaying various benefits um, because, of, uh, because of the assimilation that we were speaking about earlier on. It doesn't go forward to speak about um, the, 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 you know, some of the tribalist um, you know, and, and cultural conflicts which are colonially constructed, just as race was colonially constructed. Um, I also think that you know, black consciousness is, is originally foregrounded on creating unity between black people. And I argue that by erasing the, you know, the, other, um, the other issues that we, ha we necessarily have to deal with as part of the decolonization project um, is creating that understanding that Biko, um, Bani Pichana, and more recently Andrew Mutama give um, to black consciousness um, does, does very little then alienate um, you know, uh, some of us um, from the theory um, and, and from its current understanding. Um, I also invite, I also, you know, believe that um, perhaps then, you know, the development of black consciousness as a theory should move towards um, a listening, you know, a listening. We know that theories, political theories, have to be living, right? If they're not living, they don't, you know, they don't develop. If they're not developing as fast as the humans that they're meant to serve um, and give information to and knowledges to, um, then they end up becoming obsolete um, and, you know, no longer become of help. And I think that black consciousness has to do that work quite quickly um, if it wants to keep up um, with some of the other political thoughts um, and action which is going on. So... Two. Another, another point that Andy Lingutama says, and I'm going to quote him. Today in the white world exist two relationships which intersect, if you like. The relationship between white and black is a vertical one. And from this relationship, it doesn't matter what language you speak, what culture you have, what sexual orientation you are, what age you are, you are just black. That's how the white world treats you. Of course, if you do it in a horizontal fashion amongst ourselves as black people, then these differences begin to make sense. But in the relationship between us and white people, there is no gender that matters. <sighs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, so, I mean, so this, 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 us, this understanding, the understanding that Mkutama, and I want to, I want to also stress, you know, that this is Mutama's interpretation and conceptualization of black consciousness. Um, you know, I don't think it necessarily, you know, um, as I said earlier on, it's living, um, and perhaps it's our job to, 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 to punctuate it um, with more you know, pragmatic um, thinking and, 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 and more subjectivity, um, which speaks to us. Because you know, it fundamentally misses you know, the point of how colonization um, constructed a lot of our identities, not only around blackness, which is essentially how much melanin we have in our skins, but also constructed you know, our identities around our sex, sexual orientation, um, and gender. Um, it's a comprehensive system, right? Co colonization is a comprehensive system which basically affords hum humanity to a single type of person um, and inhumanity to everyone else. So if you're white, um, middle class, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgender, you know, urban-based, western-educated um, white man, you're a human, and everything else, you know, of course, according to an order, which is also co colonially constructed, um, then, you know, you're ascribed a little bits of humanity as the sliding scale goes down the line. Um, and then, again, referencing to how law um, 
is still a colonial construct. Um, we can even see in terms when, when, when these constructions were made, um, the law was, 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 was um, instrumental in maintaining that. We see that through sodomy laws, which was really a clamp, a clamp down against you know, sexual orientation um, you know, and, and, and a clamp down that was, that was trying to enforce a heterosexuality for its own gains, right? Um, it was trying to enforce heterosexuality, and I argue not because it particularly thinks that it's right. Um, I think because there were benefits to enforcing heterosexuality. Slavery couldn't go on because slaves had to bear children. Um, la later on, the labor couldn't be sustained if there were no children bo you know, born. And so how dare you know, black people, how dare black people decide not to have children for us? Um, and so I think you know, it's important to understand those. We also see it in the family laws, where for the longest time, and you know, even in South Africa, um, you know, family law um, ascribed minor, minority status to women people, right? So you're ch you a child, you couldn't make your own decision. You know, when you're married, when you're married, your husband, right, made all the decisions for you. And before you're married, um, your father, you know, um, had you know perpetual guardianship um, over you. Um, you know. These constructions, you know, these constructions, these colonially made constructions. I mean, I've got a long list here, and I don't want to, I don't exhaust the list um, because of also time. But we can even see it in terms of gender and gender expression. There was very, very particular policing there, which was con colon which, which arises colonially, right? Um, because time and time again, um, the archives do bring up, um, you know gender diversity and gender expression diversity, um, which you know within those contexts. Um, was was spiritually loaded, right? Um, and 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 yeah, I'm also interested in, in just perhaps thinking about how that has moved um, over time to now, um, all of a sudden being people who are gender diverse or gender expression diverse, um, literally being you know the absolute absolute of, uh, opposite um, of the of the deities and, and and you know the spiritual leaders um, that they once that they once were in our societies. Um, and so, you know, as all of these constructs went further, you know, than merely race, right? And this is something that their consciousness, as interpreted by Andilin Otama, misses. Um, you know, and so, and so this is why perhaps then um, black radical feminists um, have ascribed new language to it, partly inspired by people um, such as, you know, Bauhooks who coined, you know, who wanted to also was trying to make this expression of something which is a comprehensive system of colonization being a comprehensive system and how we've retained that system now and try to term it the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Um, but perhaps you can nuance that and say and call it the imperialist, white supremacist, ableist, capitalist, cis patriarchy, um, which I think gives a more representation, even though it still doesn't fully do the job um, of how complex um, what we're dealing with here um, is. Um, again, what, what, what Angela Mutawa misses is that as people are also colonial subjects, um, we, you know, we, we, weren't born in, we weren't born in the 1800s um, or the 18th century or the 19th century. However, we're still colonial subjects, right, because the system has remained. We've been raised under the system, you know, by people who are also subjects of the system. Um, and so by black consciousness um, holding on to this idea that um, we're prefaced by race, um, it kind of wants to jump back and think that it's not a, sub you know, a, a subject of colonization and that the people who thought it up were also not subjects of colonization, which they were, right? And we always have to look at what we're thinking about, what we're reading from that perspective. We're all wounded, we're all tainted, you know, and we have to do that work before. We can't skip that step um, because if we skip that step, We've gone back to step one, and we're just reinforcing um, colonization. So Andira Mutama um, goes on to say, and I'm going to get another quote. Um, and and he, it's, this is he's directly carrying on um, from from the last um, abstract. If we accept the vertical relationship, black people's sins are absolved. With the white man, our experiences are shaped by the system. We must put blame in the white society. Using this structural analysis then, we can't insist on individual culpability. Be careful of privileging your experience and your reality. Be suspicious of your own feelings, because your experience has not, made, has not been made by you. Reality is not 
reality is shaped not by ourselves, but by the indivisible white hand. And I mean, I must, I must also, you know, concede that, you know, a structural analysis is important um, when we're thinking about this, right? Because as I mentioned before, this is really much structural, it's systematic, um, you know, and it's deeply ingrained in everything that we do, say, think, um, where, you know, um, and it's important to think of it as as as, as a system. Um, but I don't I don't necessarily think that that um, absolves men from you know being held accountable, particularly um, within our fallist movements. Um, speaking particularly from a Rose Must Fall um, perspective, we've done a lot of work um, as black women, as black queer people. Um, We've done a lot of work um, trying to infiltrate the space with, with a nuanced um, type of, 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 of politic. Um, but it hasn't really gone anywhere, right? And this tells me, you know, this, this rings alarm bells of perhaps not because people are not learning, it's not because perhaps people just don't know. I really do think that, as again, because people, you know, men, people, cis hate men are subjects, you know, of the system and have been tainted by the system and been wounded by the system just like everybody else, there's rather um, a resistance towards learning. There's, there's, they've blockaded, you know, um, and they continuously blockade. Um, and, and I think, yeah, so, so there's actually a resistance to learning um, and, and I, I don't really buy you know, this issue of, um, of, of, like, we can't hold, you know, um, the people who are, uh, who are doing very real, you know, very, who are inflicting very real violence and abuse on us, right? Um, you know, um, so people have buried their mothers from domestic violence, their sisters. Um, people have lost their best friends, you know, um, you know, we've been raped. Uh, you know, there's various things which have happened to us at the hands of black men. Um, and I do think that, um, I, I don't think it's enough to just say that, you know, these things are systematic, therefore we can remove ourselves because we've been able to transcend some things. You know, a lot of us are sitting here having tran transcended race to a certain extent because we're able to sit here, reflect on it, be critical of it, you know, reject it. Um, um, and so I, I'm not quite sure then how, how we can argue that the same is not possible with patriarchy and cis-normativity and ableism. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and it's also interesting that Uandem Otama says that he's cautioning people of being, for being, for being, you know, relying on how they're feeling, you know, um, and, and to, to not be reliant on the experiences because they're systematic and not cautioning people for, rela for, for acting for, for, for relying on their actions and their impulses, right? Because I really do think, perhaps you should caution people that when you think that you're entitled to a woman's body, think where that's coming from, right? There's a context for that. Um, and I don't think he's doing that work. Um, and, and, and the reason he says, you know, for that is that the reason he, he provides for why um, Black black women um, should, should should distrust um, their feelings towards towards the the black men um, who are antagonist who are violent and abusive and and patriarchal towards them um, is that the the contradictions within the intra the interracial sphere so between black people are non antagonistic um, the former cannot be ended. Um, so the vertical relationship cannot, between blacks, black people and white people cannot be defeated without defeating whiteness. Sharp. But then he says, in the black space, we cannot resolve, oh, we have to resolve with patience and dialogue because we're not enemy. Um, and we don't dialogue, um, and we don't dialogue with the enemy, which is, you know, whiteness, um, because they, because, yeah, they're the enemy. Um, and again, I mean, my response to this was that dialogue has always been there, right? Um, you know, I think for, for, very, for, for the archives, you know, show, so in the long-term history, but even in the short-term history, the archives do show that there's been a constant negotiation with patriarchy, right? There have been, 
you know, those, 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 um, th those spaces where negotiations and dialogue and discussion and patience and understanding have been created, you know, particularly not in ways that we would, um, we would, we, we would identify them now. Um, but I do know that, you know, there has been those instances throughout history, um, where black women were negotiating their spaces in different ways. Um, and, and, and I think it's disingenuous to, to, to wish that away um, and now you know, call, call upon us to do that once again when for centuries it hasn't been working. Um, you know, and so, and what's interesting is then, you know, so black women haven't taken up arms. <laughs> <laughs> so they haven't taken up arms, right? Um, and uh, I fear that maybe one day we will. Um, so I don't know. But, but you know, and, and that's because there's also an, a, 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 a resistance um, to other forms, to other forms of resistance that black radical women are doing. Um, not so long ago, RMF women did what we called a reclamation of the space. Um, there was a meeting. Um, we're certain men, in fact, let me name, yeah, we, we're not being politically correct. So, um, a, a, a very famous, a man who's become very famous called Kumani Makwele had brought another man who had become very famous um, called Vuyani Pambo, which have, you know, ascended, you know, as really the faces um, of what's going on across, you know, South African um, universities into the RMF space, um, into a space we had called Azania. A couple of months before that, we had a, a, like an entire black woman raped in the same space. Um, and nothing really had happened. The, the case is somewhere in the, in the judicial, judicial system. Um, and like, it's, a, it's, a, an, it's an appalling you know, um, story and it's actually, yeah. Um, and so we did what it was a reclamation. We, we literally kicked them out and we said that you're not going to be allowed in this space. We're taking it up. Um, because we, like we 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 we're, we're like we're retaking, we're reclaiming the space, we're reclaiming this movement because we no longer see ourselves in it, right? Um, and 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 you know and and this was because also by inviting Vuani Pambo, there had already been discussions on how you know the various men in the other um, you know uprisings across the South African um, universities. Um, had been showing, you know, similar signs of woman erasure, of queer erasure, and to some points even antagonism, um, uh, and, and wouldn't, as, as radical black feminists of RMF, we wouldn't allow such people into the space. And so we claim the space. Another form of resistance um, that, that um, has taken place is, as alluded to um, by Nasha earlier on, um, was an organization called the Trans Collective, which I, which I helped to sustain. Um, recently um, uh, uh, had a radical intervention towards the RMF exhibition, which was celebrating RMF's first um, uh, birthday, as it were. Um, and the reason for that was that since day one again, so the trans collective in its formation was formed because trans people couldn't see themselves in the movement. We had drafted the statement that Banashi was um, read, read an excerpt from, um, was drafted um, by something that I'd call the Intersectionality Audit Committee, which I was a part of, and which all the other trans people within RMF were a part of. Um, and, and we were a strong lobby for intersectionality. And everybody in RMF at the time had, had acquiesced to that and had agreed to that and was committed to that. However, literally from day one, there's been a gradual, gradual um, departure from that. Um, and I think that has come to a point now where that can no longer be tolerated, right? And there will be no RMF without the trans people and without the woman people. Um, and so I think, yeah, and so that, that has been one of, one, one of the you know, strategies for resistance um, that, we've, that we've been doing um, apart um, from, 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 from dialoguing, right? From holding, I don't know, information sessions and saying patriarchy is bad. Men know patriarchy is bad and that's why no, none of them want to admit that I'm a patriarch. I challenge any man here to stand, you know, to stand out on this podium and say, yeah, I'm a patriarch and I'm proud, it's a good thing and I'm going to show you, right? Because they reinforce patriarchy in other ways, right? Sometimes invisible. Um, but, and so, yeah, and so, I mean,
So, an ex like, there's an extensive list. I have here ratchet feminism or whole feminism. Um, and I mean, people may be a bit cautious um, and a bit suspect of this, but are, uh, what I think and the meaning that I've ascribed to, to whole feminism or ratchet feminism um, is basically an audacious um, reclamation of the body of the sexuality, of the sexual orientation, right? That I'm a black queer trans woman, um, and really my body is mine to own. I can strip naked right now, you know, and and you know I can I can you know my 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 sexual pleasure is political, um, and I politicize it on purpose, um, and 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 you know it's just that deliberate reclaiming of the self um, in ways which colonization and even our movements, Shannon, um, and so. The last, um, the last quote um, from from Andile Ultama, and this is and this is him proposing a solution. Um, in fact, um, and so he he wants to propose black love as a solution. Um, yeah, and so um, Wanelli Sakaba has, um, you know, been quite instrumental in forming my understanding of black love, um, even though you know. I, Previously, I didn't, I didn't quite like the word love because in many ways it's constructed and like I'm not even sure if I know, yeah. But, you know, it's a term now and it's a political term um, and I think I quite like it, um, but I don't like how time deals with it. But so he's, so he says, so black love is a solution. Black love is not and must not be built on an ethical basis. Black love does not mean accepting being bullied and silenced. Black love does not mean putting our contradictions under the table and keep them shut under this white, white mailing system um, that, is a that it is a family matter. But we should know that when we are out there with the white enemy, we are not going to raise our family issues there. Ingwagi Esinayo Manje is that in the middle of the war with the white person, the sister complains. Of course she is right and I am wrong, but we need to be able to say that this moment let us deal with the enemy. It does not mean we must go back to talk. We must not go back to talk. You must say let's let us do the talking. Your behavior as a black brother is not helping us. Black 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 love means taking responsibility for creating this liberated ter territory or enclave. Black love does not mean suspending criticism um, amongst ourselves. Black love must mean spiritedness must not mean um, mean-spiritedness amongst us. Black love does not mean that black, but black love does mean though that blacks come first. Um, and so, I mean, I definitely agree that blacks come first, um, but in my particular instance, um, black queer trans women also come first um, because that's my, subjecti my subjectivity and that's my lived reality. And basically what I'm saying that I literally say that I'm coming first, right? Um, and, and, and that's important for me to, 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 um, to reaffirm. Um, but then I get the sense that Andilim Otama and many of what we call the whole tips which look up to him um, place black love as a burden on the other, right? So the black woman must exercise black love. Yeah, because like you must ex you must like accept that I'm like I'm a bad person towards you. Like accept it. Um, and we can slowly work through it, but like yeah, even though black men don't really show black love because we definitely know that wow they rape us, they murder us, you know, because, and that's because of the unwillingness to change, um, you know, um, and so the expectation is on us, and not, you know, and not on them, right, um, but also it's interesting because even when we're trying to deal with patriarchy and cis-normativity and heteronormativity, the response is not black love, the response is antagonism, the response is walking out, the response is say, you, you know, and this is the things which have happened, the response is like saying that we're going to deal with you, how dare you disrupt this exhibition, we'll deal with you, right, you better watch out. And so there's almost double speak here, right, where black love is raised when it's convenient, right, but when we touch you in your studio, right, when you can't, when you win, <laughs> when we touch you in your studio um, and you don't um, and, and we, we don't let you know people come in and, 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 and look at your photos photos which make you like you know black Jesus <coughs> yeah, you know, photos which make you, you know RMF's Jesus you get touched and you're angry and your response is not black love your response is not of one of sitting down and dialoguing and wanting to understand of patience your, your response is violence your response is like I'm gonna hurt you. 
because you're irritating me and you're depriving me and I will not stand it, right? Um, and also, you know, this idea of black love in the way that Andy Lengwetama conceptualizes it also, you know, doesn't look at the fact, again, that, um, that these are not merely contradictions that we can go talk about at home. They're not too, like, you know, misunderstandings. They're meta. There's a death toll. Right, I can tell you statistics is a death toll. People you know even today, um, you know, people are being laid to rest because of that. And and so, you know, so like I mean, when we use contradictions, I think it's really trivializing um, and understating, you know, the pervasiveness and uh, and and, uh, and you know and the danger, you know, of 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 of, of patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia. Um, and then perhaps then to punctuate with my own understanding of black love um, as something, as, as tough love, right? Maybe we can call black love and, and a synonym for it, a less political synonym for it could be tough love. It's this, it's, it's this idea that I'm going to be tough towards you. I'm not going to compromise to, uh, on, uh, no, um, about, about dealing, uh, about, about like, I don't know, bringing you, engaging with you and holding you accountable because, um, because I love you and I want you to be better. Right, so I'm going to have to resist towards you because my idea, you know, of loving you is making you a better person. My idea of loving you is not making you, you know, um, like me or you know feel comfortable. My idea of black love, because we have to know that we're, we're fighting a silent war, um, you know, and 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 you know, time time is ticking, um, and people have to get moving. And my idea of black love is definitely that. Um, you're going to have to. You're going to have to do work, and I'm going to use force. Um, you know, even if the force is my body, even if the first force is the sting of my of my words, but I'm going to use force um, because you have to. You have to jump on the right boat now. Um, um, and yeah, it basically means that I'm, I'm trying to resist the small bits of this enemy, of this white enemy you speak of, which are highly, highly still lying dormant within you. Um, and so, I mean, perhaps then in closing, I can just um, say that, um, so when, when Marilyn was speaking about pace, um, there's, you know, so decolonization is urgent. We know that it's, it's very much urgent. Um, and, and, and so it's urgent, um, A, because simply we're dying and suffocating. Um, secondly, because there's various things which are coming at us, um, which are, which are, I don't know, which are confusing us, you know, even talk, as Bernard was saying, about transformation, you know, what we, we're now terming like reformist politics. You know, my, my idea, um, particularly of the law, is that perhaps we should rethink the law, right? Um, who says that there's only one way to do law, right? Who says that there's only courts and legislation and parliaments? We can rethink all of that. I do think I do think we have the capacity, and we have to do that work. Um, and there's other ways in which we can maintain order. Like I mean, that's even like wow. That's because the law. Those are justifications for the law, right? And I'm 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 immediately going to them, right? Which is also problematic, because like I'm I'm trying to move away, but you know I'm afraid. Yes, I'm afraid, right? Um, but I think we have to go there. Um, and part of going there is definitely definitely trying to deal um, with 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 a, with a with the colony which still lives within ourselves, right, um, and how we're upholding that. Um, and perhaps then the discussion following this could, could try um, and make moves in terms of addressing the colony, you know, the Jan van Riebeck in us, and how Jan van Riebeck in many ways lives through us. Thank you.